Good morning, and welcome to Calvary Moravian's live stream service. Uh, thank you for joining us in worship this morning. We have a few things that we want to draw uh, your attention to. Uh, first, Pastor Lane and Lillianne will be on vacation beginning tomorrow through, uh, through Tuesday, September 8th, uh, and he will return to the office on Wednesday, September the 9th. Uh, I will be leading this Wednesday's Bible study, August 26, uh, beginning at 6.30 via Zoom. Uh, and as always, you can find the web address in your online bulletin. Uh, we also want to remind you, uh, or also want to let you know that the Missions Committee is sponsoring a blood drive on Tuesday, September 15th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, during this uncertain time of COVID-19, there has been an urgent need for blood. Uh, so we will be uh, operating out of the Red Cross mobile bus, which will be parked in our back lot of the church. And uh, in order to keep people socially distanced, we will uh, have signups via an appointments, which you can find uh, the site to make an appointment also in our online bulletin. We also want to remind you of the work of the missions committee to collect uh, welc items for welcome home kits for city with dwellings. Uh, we will have drop off times uh, this coming Tuesday uh, August 25th uh, from 4 to 6 p.m., as well as next Sunday, August 30th from 2 to 4 p.m., uh, and you will find a list of the donations needed for those welcome home kits also uh, in your bull online bulletin. And at, at those drop-off times, you can also bring uh, non-perishable food items for Sunnyside Ministry, and the Missions Committee will be able to get those over to Sunnyside. So now let us turn our hearts and our minds to Christ, who meets us here today. Let us worship God.
opening hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 469, Come Let Us Sing the Song of Songs. pray together the liturgy for adoration. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising up to the setting of the sun, the name, name of, of the Lord, Lord be praised. to you, Lord God, our Father. You are the merciful Father, the God from whom all help comes. You chose us in Jesus Christ our Lord before the creation of the world. You rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of your dear Son. In our union with Christ, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. You have made us worthy to share that which you have reserved for your people in the kingdom of light. Your love is so great that we may be called the children of God. Therefore, with the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we join in proclaiming the glory of your name.
Praise, honor, and glory be to you, Christ Jesus, Son of the living God. To you, you be glory at all times in the church which waits on earth for you and in which, which is in you in heaven now and forever. Jesus, you are the eternal word who became a human being and lived among us. Those who were yours saw your glory, the glory which you received as the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. In you, the full content of the divine nature dwells in a human body. You are the true God and eternal life. Through you, the whole universe is reconciled to God. You made peace through your death on the cross. Therefore, God raised you to the highest place above and gave you the name, which is greater than any other name. Spirit, our teacher, guide, and comforter. We proclaim your righteousness and praise. You pour out the love of God into the hearts of all believers and make their bodies your holy temples. By our own reason and strength, we cannot believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him, but you call us through the gospel and enlighten us with gifts of grace. You dedicate us to God in the, tr in the true faith, and you enable us to remain in union with Jesus Christ. We praise you together with the Father and the Son, now and forever. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name amen the lord says i even i am the god who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins go and sin no more lord make us truly one in spirit with all your faithful people as we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and he was made man. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeded from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. calls us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. As an act of worship, let us now return to God our offerings. These offerings come in different forms and take many different shapes, but are all worthy gifts to God. So we remind you that if you want to support the ministry of Calvary financially, you can send a check to our church office or you can use our online giving portal on our website. It is your generosity that makes possible our service to this community and to this congregation. And however you support God's kingdom, we come together as one body of Christ to, ex to extend God's never-ending grace into our world.
God, we thank you for meeting us here in this place and extending your grace to each one of us. So take these offerings and use them for your people in this land and throughout your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. It is uh, from chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be con conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, T the teacher in teaching, the extoller in, ex in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Our gospel lesson today comes from the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Now when G Jesus came into the dist district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, he said to them but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and you will bind on earth what will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Hey guys, it's so good to see you all this morning and I want you to know that we sure have been thinking about you as you have started back to school. I know that some of you are attending school on your computers at home and some of you are going to school. So know that we are thinking of you during this time and we're praying for you. We sure do miss you here in the congregation. Last week, Mr. Bear here in the front went to sleep. I looked out while I was preaching and he was all slumped over. So we need you here to wake up all the stuffed animals that you brought to be with us. Uh, Pastor Chaz just read a wonderful story and it's about the time that Jesus took his disciples on a retreat. And many of you have been to Laurel Ridge, you've been to summer camp, and you know how wonderful it is to sort of get away from things and get away with your friends or by yourself and experience the presence of God. And that's sort of what Jesus did with his followers. And they went to this place called Caesarea Philippi. It was far, far north in a place called Galilee. And while they were there, Jesus asked them a very important question. He said to them, who do you think that I am? And they must have sort of looked at him, puzzled, and then finally, one of his followers named Simon said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And so when Simon said that, he was saying that Jesus was in fact the Son of God. And Jesus was really pleased with what Simon said because he praises him and then he said something really neat. He said, Peter, remember, really he said, Simon, from now on your name is going to be Peter. 
And I brought a rock this morning. This is a wonderful rock that my father-in-law gave me from New Mexico. It's really, really heavy. And when Jesus looked at Simon and he said, because you have said this, from now on your name is going to be Petros. And I brought this to show you in Greek, in the Greek language, Jesus said he would be Petros, and that is Peter in English. And then the meaning of that word is rock. So really, Jesus was telling Peter that what he had just said, that his confession would be the rock that the church would be built on. And that's what we remember today, that Jesus is our rock. And the church is built on him because he's strong and he's always going to be there for us and he's always going to love us. And let's pray and thank God for that. Dear God, we thank you that your son Jesus is indeed the rock upon which the church is built. And we pray that today we might also remember to say, that you are Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Amen. After we observe a moment of silence this morning in prayer, I'll lead us in a time of intercession. And after each intercession, I invite you to join me in praying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Everlasting God, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for revealing him as Messiah and Savior of the world. Thank you that your Son gave St. Peter the keys to the kingdom as a reward for his lively and outspoken faith. And may his confession be our own, the bedrock belief of your church here on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for your church, and we ask that it might always provide a solid foundation upon which we can build our lives. We especially pray today for Christians around the world who pay a heavy price for faith, who experience hostility, even from their government, from their employers or from their neighbors as a result of their identification with your son, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, help us to be reliable and honest in what we do and friendly to all we meet in our daily lives. Help us always to give our best, to work to our fullest, and to never be ashamed to confess your name. In our leisure time, help us to play hard but to play fair. Help us to win without boasting and to lose graciously without making excuses. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for all the ill, the lonely, and distressed. 
especially for those with fear arising from our global pandemic. We pray for healing and wholeness for all and for ourselves. And help us to bring life and love, joy and hope to those who live in despair. And give help to all those treating the effects of COVID-19 and to those working to find a cure. We also pray for those in our church family and beyond who stand in need of your healing mercy today. For those who have recently faced surgery and are recovering at home. For those who are in treatment or therapy. For any who need your healing touch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, remember the souls of all your servants now fallen asleep in you. And for those who are saddened by their passing, be with the bereaved in their loneliness and give them faith to look beyond their present trouble to your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again and who lives forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, faithful God, forgive us when we only turn to you when things trouble us and when we forget to thank you daily for your blessings and bounty. Help us to recognize all the wonderful things in your world for which we should be grateful. And send us out into the coming week ready to show our gratitude in all that we say and in all that we do. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You've probably noticed, I know I have in recent days, that our culture is very divided. Particularly in this election year when factions develop over allegiances to candidates or to parties or to opinions on various issues. Even in this time of pandemic when one would hope that we might come closer together You've probably noticed that factions have developed around the pandemic, how it has been handled, and even how we as individuals are to act responsibly in relationship to it. Increasingly, these factions and divisions are flamed, I think, by allegiances to particular people, to philosophies, to practice. And we can easily label others, can't we, as belonging to this group or to that group. Or we say that individuals are adherents to a particular philosophy or a certain way of thinking. And sadly, in many cases, because of these factions, relationships have been fragmented and some have even been severed. We forget, our, I think, that our identity as persons can never be tied to another human, to any human philosophy, to any faction, because according to Scripture, our baptism has identified us with only one person to whom any of us should have absolute allegiance and that is Jesus Christ. In today's gospel, Jesus asked his disciples a question about his identity. But he does it far away from the needy crowds. It seems evident that Jesus has taken his disciples on a sort of spiritual retreat to spend time with them and to prepare them for the time when he will go to Jerusalem suffer, be killed, and on the third day rise. Now the place they travel to is called Caesarea Philippi. 
That city was known as the city of pagans. It was a Gentile city far north of Galilee. We know that Emperor Augustus had given the town to Herod the Great as a gesture of thanks. And so Herod built a temple there to honor Caesar and named it Caesarea. And then upon the death of the emperor, Herod's son Philip enlarged the city and he added, of course, his own name. Thus Caesarea Philippi. This place was located at the foot of Mount Hermon, one of the highest mountains in northern Israel. And it had been the place where the fertility god Baal was worshipped in the time of the Old Testament. It was also referred to as Pontius, to utter Pan, the Greek god of desolate places. And it was in Caesarea that Pan, the Greek god, was worshipped. We're told that large caves with a spring were located there, and many believed these caves were a sort of gateway to the underworld where the fertility gods would all live in the wintertime. And in order to entice all of these gods to return in the spring, the people of the city would often engage in horrible deeds. So with all of this in mind, why would Jesus choose Caesarea, a sort of red light district, as the place to take the disciples on a spiritual retreat, particularly when it was known for the worship of pagan gods and immoral practices. Doesn't really seem like the ideal setting for a spiritual experience, does it? But I think Jesus was very intentional because it's they stand there in the midst of all these pagan gods that many people, even the Israelites, had been tempted to worship and identify with for centuries, the popular gods of culture that people often followed or adhered to, surrounded by all of these popular deities, Jesus asked the most important question he will ever ask his followers. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Jesus wants to know if his followers understand his identity as God's Son, so he invites them first to think about all the things that they've heard about him. What have other people said about me? You'll notice their answer to that question. Well, Jesus, some say that you're John the Baptist. This was one way people looked at Jesus in that time because you'll remember that Herod Antipas was afraid of Jesus because maybe he thought John the Baptist was coming back from the dead to haunt him since he was the one who had John beheaded in the first place. One of the other disciples says, Well, Jesus, some people think you are Elijah. Since Elijah had been taken alive by a chariot into heaven, some thought he might return one day as a sort of messianic figure. Just like there are an abundance of factions and opinions in our culture today, there were various sects and opinions among the people about when the Messiah would come, what the Messiah would do, how the Messiah would be identified. And after hearing all of their answers as they express these popular explanations about his identity, Jesus gets personal and very direct. He, does, he doesn't just want to know the identity others are giving him. He wants to know how his followers see him. And so he asks them a very penetrating question but who do you say that I am (laughs) an old impetuous Peter who could be faithful one minute and fickle the next who is never hesitant to blurt out his opinions is now in this moment used by God to be the mouthpiece for making the world's greatest 
and most faith-filled confession, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Now remember that Christ is simply the Greek title for the Hebrew word Messiah. So in essence, Peter, in that important moment, confesses his own personal belief. Not what other people say, but what the Spirit of God has led him to say, that Jesus is God incarnate, come in the flesh to save his people. And listen to how Jesus responds to Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven And then, because Peter has so clearly understood Jesus' identity as the Son of God, this one who has been known as Simon receives a new identity. I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. A new identity. Simon will now be called Peter, which in Greek means rock, because he has made the rock bed confession upon which the church will be built and upon which the church will endure. This confession is lasting. It is eternal. So much so that even the powers of death and hell will not prevail against the church that makes this confession. Now you'll notice in this text from Matthew that Jesus doesn't praise Peter because of his accomplishments as a disciple. He praises Peter for his testimony, for his confession that Jesus is the Christ. So the church, my friends, is not founded on Peter, nor on John the Baptist, or Elijah, or any great theologian, nor any interpretation, nor any slogan, nor any philosophy. It is founded, and it will prevail as long as the church adheres to Peter's confession. Yes, the church will change. There's no doubt about that. The church has changed many times throughout the centuries, but the church has been enabled by God's Holy Spirit to recreate itself at the various crossroads of time to discover new ways of ministering an unchanging message to each changing generation. I believe that we are in such a moment now COVID-19 has, and it will continue to change us. New needs have emerged. New opportunities await us. New challenges engage us. But Jesus' identity as God's Son come in flesh to love us remains the same. This is our abiding hope in the midst of a changing and a chaotic world, a world of division and faction and the latest fashionable opinion. When we build our personal and our communal identity upon Christ, we build, in the words of the hymn writer, upon a rock that will not move. When we build on Christ, We build on a secure and lasting foundation, a foundation that can endure and adapt to the winds of change, a foundation that is strong enough that it can sort of flex, it can move, it can adjust to shifting needs. I'd be far from honest with you this morning if I didn't confess that I have some concerns about the future ministry of the Big C Church, especially in the United States and Europe. 
If you read nothing but statistics, you could easily become discouraged. Let me just share a few with you. A Pew Research study indicates that there is a rise in a group called the nuns who have no religious affiliation. In the last five years alone, unaffiliated numbers have increased from just over 15% to just under 20% of all U.S. adults. This group now includes 13 million self-described atheists and agnostics, nearly 60% of the U.S. public as well as 33 million people that have no religious affiliation. And between 1990 and 2011, the Moravian Church in America, like other Protestant traditions, saw a 30% decline in its membership. Now, I don't share these statistics with you this morning to be a Debbie Downer. I share them to remind us that in order for us to continue sharing the confession that Jesus is the Son of God, we cannot ignore the reality around us. We must continue to explore and even experiment with new and creative ways to share this unchanging message. You know, this is our heritage as Moravian Christians. Because we were known, particularly in the days of the renewed Moravian church, to be creative, to be innovative, to be responsive to the needs of those we served. This call to serve the current generation, it may involve some loss on all our parts, even some grief like we've seen during this current pandemic. But Jesus reminds us, doesn't he, that whatever we lose for the sake of the kingdom, new life will emerge. From death always comes resurrection. Peter Vogt, a Moravian pastor and theologian in Herrenhut, Germany, has written these powerful words, and I would invite you to listen very closely. He says, our concern about the identity of our church should not be guided by a fear of loss. It should not be guided by the focus on preserving our historical heritage, but rather by the desire to become what God is calling us to be. The desire to become what God is calling us to be. Though this time dealing with the COVID virus has been exhausting for all of us in different and various ways and has involved loss and even grief in certain things, it's also brought some silver linings. One of which is our deeper appreciation for human contact and for relationships. It's also increased in us, I think, an appreciation for our faith and for the church, the community of believers. So as we look toward the future, to how things might be or even become in the days before us, I'll be honest in saying I'm not fearful. Like you, I might get a little anxious sometimes, yes. But I do not fear what will be or what we might become as a result of this experience. And you know why? Because I know who holds the future. And I know that if the church continues to proclaim this unchanging message of a crucified Lord who is the Savior of the world, the confession that Peter first made, that nothing will destroy Christ's church. Will it change? Will it look different? Will there be differences? Of course there will be. That's part of our human life cycle, and it's part of the life cycle of the church because the church is a living and growing and moving organism. 
So I hope today, having once again looked at this historic bedrock text of the New Testament, all of us will reclaim our personal commitment to identify exclusively, exclusively with the person of Jesus Christ. That together, we the church might face the future unafraid, secure in the timeless confession first made by Simon, who became Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the foundation of the church. We thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the foundation of our lives. And so we pray even in these uncertain times, times even of faction and conflict and division in our land, that you will enable us as Christians to be unifiers and to continue to bring the good news to changing times of a changeless message. For we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of dedication is hymn 479 in your blue hymnal, and it's found on page 11 in your online bulletin. Christ is our Master, Lord, and God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>